Good morning, Concord family. It is so great to worship with you this morning from wherever you may be uh, listening and, and uh, watching online this service from our various campuses. Uh, it's just a joy to be able to bring God's word as, and, and to share what God is saying to us both musically and from his written word. Um, it's exciting that we're going to be able to begin gathering together again, opening up step by step in stages. Uh, and I just want to take a moment this morning and, and say something about your team, your staff, your leaders here at Concord. Um, this is new ground for everyone. As, as you know, none of us have ever walked through this before. Uh, none of us have ever experienced this uh, type thing uh, where we've had to, to be out of the church setting uh, for many weeks now. Uh, so I want to compliment your pastoral team, your leadership team, your, your church staff, your, your lay leaders for the incredible job that they are doing in uh, working towards reopening. Uh, there is no pattern for this. There is, there is, there is no blueprint. There, there's no model. And uh, different churches are doing different things, and, and there's not a right way or a wrong way. Uh, you just have to pray and seek God's wisdom and do what God leads in each setting, in each situation. And certainly your team has done that. So when you have an opportunity, uh, be sure and thank them and, and encourage them. Also, thank you. Uh, for joining online week after week after week and, and uh, not being able to be in one place to fellowship together as, as we love to do. Uh, I want to, I wanna, again, compliment you for, for your faithfulness during this period of time. This morning we are continuing our study in the book of James. Today, James chapter 3. So if you would turn in your Bibles there uh, and, and uh, read along with me and, and look at this passage Today, as, as we talk about the importance of the words we speak, the importance of the words we speak, one-fifth of our time on earth is spent talking. One-fifth of our time. Someone has said those who talk to themselves spend even more time. Uh, I have a bad habit. My wife laughs at me because uh, I'll talk to Siri. I talk to Alexa. I talk back when uh, one of my devices, uh, I'm traveling, gives me directions and that kind of thing. So I'm sure I spend more than one-fifth of my time here on earth talking. Someone has said in a year, we use enough words to fill 66 books of 800 pages each. 66 books of 800 pages each. Think about it. When you go to the doctor, uh, what's one of the first things if you're not feeling well or if you're uh, in for a checkup, the doctor does? He says, or she says, open your mouth. And then they take the, the tongue suppressor, they put it on your tongue, and they look at your tongue, they look at your throat. I, because your, your tongue says a lot about your health. Well, the truth of the matter is, our tongues, the Bible says, have a lot to tell us about our spiritual health. And there's no place where this is more true than in the book of James. A couple of weeks ago when I was here with you, uh, I preached from James chapter 1 and, and, uh, and I uh, uh, talked about the tongue just a little bit because James touches on it in James, in James 1. And if you were online with us, you may recall that I said later in the book he gets in depth with this conversation and that is exactly what he does in James chapter 3 and what James 3 reveals to us is this the power of our words James teaches us that we need to consider carefully what we say look at the first two verses uh, we begin there to learn that we will be judged by the words we speak We'll be judged by the words that we speak. Look at those first two verses of James 3. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able, look at this next statement, to control his whole body. James literally says how we live our lives uh, in large part begins with the words that we speak. He says not many should be teachers. For, for those who teach, 
who exert influence through teaching will be held to a stricter judgment. That means this morning that I'm going to be judged for what I say to you from this pulpit. God's holding me accountable uh, for, for the words that I speak. And I need to be very careful that I speak biblical truth so as not to mislead you. All who teach fall under that same strict judgment. But you know the truth of the matter is, we all influence through the words we speak. A parent influences a child. What we say to a child not only influences that child's life now, but on into, a, to, uh, into adulthood. Uh, in a marriage, what we say influences that marriage relationship, and it either weakens it or it makes it stronger. In a working environment or in the community, our words are going to be held accountable from God. So what does that say to me? That I need to be very careful what I say because I'm going to have to answer to God one day for the words that I speak. Someone has well said, if you change the way you speak, you can change the direction of your life. By changing the words you speak, and that's what James is saying. He says, because if you don't stumble in what you have to say, you're a mature man. A mark of maturity is learning to control the words we use and, and how we speak to and about others. Well, our words are going to be judged. Secondly, our words have great power. Look at verses 3 through 5. He says, now when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide the whole animal. And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites. James says that, you can take a, a very large animal, powerful animal like a horse, and put a small bit in its mouth and control the direction that it goes and control the power of that animal. You can take a small child that, that uh, horseback rides that's 60 and 70 pounds, and, and, and that small child can literally uh, control that very large animal. And then he says, or a ship, a very small rudder, can direct a very large ship. One of the shows that uh, I've been watching during this pandemic um, has been Deadliest Catch. Now, you know, you just kind of start searching for something to watch after a period of time. So I've watched several episodes of, of Deadliest Catch, and it just amazes me that, that these fishermen, uh, these crab fishermen, are on the Bering Sea in very adverse conditions. Uh, the ships are icing up, the winds are blowing, storms uh, all around them, and, and sometimes they're right in the middle of the storm. Uh, I get seasick just watching. But yet, those fishing vessels are controlled and kept afloat by a very small rudder. You say, well, what, what is that telling you? What is James saying? Well, you look at it. He says, our tongues are small uh, in comparison to the body, but they have great power. Listen, you and I possess great power through the words that we speak. Did you know by the words that you speak, you can encourage or you can discourage someone? You can build someone up or you can tear, or you can, uh, tear them down. Our words uh, can carry uh, a great uh, impact for, for years to come. Some of, of you as adults today that are, that are watching and listening, uh, you, you today I, uh, I remember words that were spoken to you as a child that, that have either encouraged you or they've discouraged you. Uh, it's amazing that, and I'm sure many of you are like me, 25 people could say something positive in a day to me. Something positive, something encouraging. But one person, especially if it's someone that I value and respect, can say something that is discouraging, guess what I remember? I don't remember the 25 people who were encouraging. The tendency is to remember the one person who was discouraging. A few words, a few words can do great good or they can do great harm. Look at what he says in that fifth verse. He says, consider how large a forest 
a small fire ignites. Many of you will remember the horrible fires that swept through the Smoky Mountains just a few years ago. Great loss of life, great devastation, and an incredibly powerful fire. And it started with a small spark. Gossip, a little gossip, a few unwise words on social media, a critical expression can cause great damage to a person. Our words carry great power. But then look, in verse 6, this is very important. Our, our words are an instrument of God or an instrument of Satan. Let me say that again. Our words are an instrument of God or an instrument of Satan. Look at that sixth verse. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body. And it sets the course of life on fire. And it is set on fire by hell. Satan's greatest weapon... Satan's greatest weapon is the human tongue. How many times have you said something and wished immediately you could take it back? Or how many times have you spoken and then you wonder, where did that come from? You see, we are either allowing our words to be an instrument of God or an instrument of Satan. We need to think before we speak, and we need to ask ourselves this question. Will what I'm about to say, or what I'm about to write, what I'm about to place on social media are the comments that I'm going to make to or about someone. Will this honor God or will it empower Satan? You say, well, I never would want to be guilty of empowering Satan, and we should not. But the words we speak can have that effect because the Bible says that the tongue is set on the fire of hell. And, that, and what that means is that, that our words can be destructive and they can be from hell itself rather than from God. Our words are either an instrument of God or they're an instrument of Satan. Number four, verses seven and eight tell us it's not easy to control the words we speak. It's not easy. It's not easy for any of us. Any of us. Now, what we need to understand as we read these verses verses 7 and 8, is that this passage, the book of James as a whole, and this passage in particular, is being written to Christians. It's being written to, the, to us who have been born again, those who have been redeemed by the power of the cross, whose lives have been changed by the power of Jesus Christ. And to, to a Christian, James says, it is not easy to control the words we speak. Look at verses 7 and 8. For every creature, creature, animal or bird, reptile or fish, is tamed and has been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. It's easier to tame a wild animal, he says, than it is to tame the human tongue. I love to go to theme parks like SeaWorld and watch uh, the animal trainers work with, with the different animals and, and how they will follow the leadership and the guidance of, of that animal trainer. I remember when our children were, were little, we, we went down to SeaWorld and we went to, to see one of the, the shows and uh, it, it was the, the huge whales and, uh, and uh, there was an area called the Splash Zone. Well, I didn't pay much attention, but my kids said, we want to sit there. Let me tell you. If you get a chance to sit in the splash zone, take my word for it, you don't want to. Let your kids sit there. You don't want to unless you want a bath in the middle of the day. When that huge well came out of the water and then hit the water, it looked like a tsunami coming I, towards me. And I just show you how brave I am, I hid behind my own children. But you know, I watched them tame those animals, and when the show was over, I, I, I wanted to go up to the animal trainers and ask if they could work with my kids for a while. But it, it, uh, James says that it's, it's easier to tame an animal than it is to tame a tongue, because the tongue is restless. So how can the tongue be tamed? Listen, only through the Holy Spirit of God. When is the last time you prayed, God help me to control my tongue? Well... 
The tongue's not easy to tame. Our words are not easy to control. But also, this is very important, we cannot separate what we say about God and what we say about people. We cannot separate what we say about God and what we say about people. Look at verses 9 through 12. It says, With the tongue, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the likeness of God. Wow. We, we bless God with our words. We honor Him. We elevate Him maybe through singing or, or through our, our speech. But He says at the same time, we use the same tongue, the same mouth to curse people, to speak negatively, criti negatively critically about people who are made in God's image. He goes on to say, Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a saltwater spring yield fresh water. <clears throat> what he says there is this. We have a tendency to say things about people we would never say about God. Did you hear that? We have a tendency to say things about people that we would never say about God. And you know what James says? Out of the same mouth, should never come blessing and cursing. Because when we speak critically or negatively about people, we're speaking about people who are made in the image of God. Listen to what 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says. If anyone says, I love God. Did you hear that? I love God, yet hates his brother. He's a liar. For the person who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Wow. If anyone says, hey, I love God, but yet we don't love our fellow man that we can see, we cannot love God. Hey, I didn't say that God did. That's very convicting to all of us. This is serious language. In other words, how can someone say he loves God when he's prejudiced? How can someone say he loves God when he's racist? How can someone say he loves God when he's a gossiper? How can someone say he loves God when he's destructive in his communication to or about people? James says that we cannot separate what we say about God and what we say about others. I don't know about you, but for me, that is very Convicting. You know, one of the things you, you learn about James when you read this book is James is in your face. He's in my face. As, I, as I've read this, as I was preparing this message, I had to start thinking, my words, are they, are they elevating? Are they uh, encouraging? Are they, are they building up? Or are they tearing down? Well, and then finally, in order to gain victory over the words we speak, we must submit our tongues to God. In order to gain victory over the words we speak, we must submit our tongues to God. Verses 13 through 18, look at those words. Who is wise and understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and lie in defiance of the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism and hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So how do we gain control of our tongues? Through the wisdom of God. Through the Holy Spirit. You see, we will either submit our words to the wisdom of God or to the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world, the Bible says in this passage that we, that we read, it, it says it's, it's sensual, it's earthly, it's demonic. But the wisdom of God is the power and the gentleness, the righteousness and the peace of God. 
Much negative conversation comes through bitter envy and selfish ambition. That's what James says. Verse 16 says, For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every kind of evil. That's not godly wisdom. You see, much of, of our criticism of others, much of our language that puts down others, is subconsciously an effort to elevate ourselves. One of my hobbies through the years has been scuba. I love to scuba dive, and I've done that for years, and, and uh, I, with groups of people, with friends, and uh, one of the things I did in, in, in scuba was to, because I was diving with so many different kinds of people, was to work my way up through rescue diver. And I was on a particular dive trip with some friends, and one of our friends, at about 80 to 100 feet, panicked, had a panic attack. And I was trying to calm him down. What did he do? He reached out and he grabbed me. He grabbed the, the buoyancy compensator, which is a vest that holds the tank that you can put an air in uh, to, to bring you to the surface or take air out of to, to make, you, make you neutral. But anyway, he grabbed that vest. What was he doing? Did, did he not want to be rescued? I was trying to rescue him. Did he not want to be rescued? He was, was he said, no, leave me alone. I don't want to be rescued. No. In his panic state in his subconscious mind he thought by pushing me down he was pushing himself up when in reality he was pulling us both down folks listen you'll never ever exalt yourself by putting others down you'll you'll never make yourself better by criticism because you see when you pull others down you're also pulling yourself down how do you, how do you uh, uh, reverse that? By submitting to the wisdom of God that can lift others up through your words and in turn lift you up at the same time. James is very clear that the tongue is very powerful. And we have an opportunity with our tongues to not only honor and bless God, but also to encourage others. And I know as followers of Christ, that's something we all want to do. We all desire to do that. It's not easy, not easy for any. There's none of us, there's no one I know, beginning with myself, that has gotten total victory over the tongue. It's a, it's a daily process. But as we grow and as we study the scripture and we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ, then God can give us the power to overcome and to conquer the tongue. I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning. <clears throat> and as you bow your heads in prayer, I'm going to ask you today to simply submit your words to the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's someone watching or listening. You say, man, I've been critical or, or I, I've not I've spoken the words I should or the way I should. Is there any hope for me? Absolutely. We're going to learn in, in, in James 4 that God gives grace. And he gives more grace and more grace. So today, you can come to him and say, God, I failed in this area and I need your grace to overcome. And you know what? God promises to provide that. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you this morning that you, through the, your wisdom, through the Holy Spirit, will give us power over the tongue. I want to thank you that you, Lord, will give us the ability to speak that that is encouraging and not discouraging. May we both honor you with our, the words of our mouths and may we honor and bless others. Father, I pray today that you would take control of the words that we speak. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to turn the service over to our campus pastors. Thank you, pastors, for what you do on your campuses. and We want you to have this time in your service. And for those of you who are now watching me online, I want to thank you for listening today. And maybe today, as you've listened or, or listened or through the weeks, you've realized that you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I want you to know you'll never regret giving your life to Christ. 
You say, well, Larry, I've been hurt by the words of others. And they were Christians. But I think you saw today that Christians can, can, can speak very mean things. They can, they can, they can use words that are, that are discouraging and destructive. But let me tell you, Jesus is just the opposite. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. And he so desires to live in your life. This morning, you can trust him. You say, well, Larry, I don't even know how. How do I trust him? Listen, if you will call the number that's on your screen right now, or you will email us at the address that you see, we would love to help you know how to have a relationship with Christ. Or maybe you've invited him in, in your life, from your living room or wherever you're watching. We'd love to celebrate with you. We want to connect with you. Maybe you just have a prayer need. That's very important. You may already be a follower of Christ, but you have a prayer need. And you'd love for prayer from, from for your, your pastors. Call that number. Email to that address. Let us connect with you. We would love to do that. I want to pray with you again. And then we're going to have a song. And I want you to join in singing on this last song as we celebrate and honor and bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for those today who may be watching that need that relationship with you, that, Lord, today they would surrender themselves to you, understanding you're a good God, you're, you're perfect, you're holy, you're forgiving. And, Lord, for the Christ followers that are watching today, that, Lord, you would encourage them. And, Lord, if, if someone's watching that's been put down and and spoken negatively about by other Christians, that, Lord, that you would overcome that with your grace, your mercy, and your love and give them peace today that passes all human understanding. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.